Thanks for coming tonight. I'm Lee Tarantino from the Visual Art Department. Um, and it's my great pleasure to introduce Dwayne Slick and Martin Smick this evening. Um, a couple things I wanted to mention. The talk will be about 45 minutes or so, and then there will be a little time at the end for Q&A. And there are microphones set up kind of halfway down the aisles. Um, so if you have a question, kind of you can walk over there and speak into the microphone. We have one more uh, upcoming event in our lecture series this semester in visual art. Ramel Ross will give a lecture on his work next Wednesday, November 16th at 5 p.m. in the Granoff Center's Martinos Auditorium. Um, you can visit the Visual Art Department website for more information. Tonight, artists Dwayne Slick and Martin Smick present work from their recent collaborative exhibition, Finding Medicom, at Fruitlands Museum in Harvard, Mass. Through this exhibition, the artists were invited to engage in dialogue with Fruitlands Native American collection, leading them to focus on King Philip's War Club, a prized object in the Fruitlands collection, as context for exploring the lingering presence of Medicom, King Philip's Wampanoag name, and the narratives that shape the telling of American history. Dwayne Slick is a Meskawaki painter and storyteller who holds a BFA in painting from the University of Northern Iowa and an MFA in painting from the University of California, Davis. He began teaching at the Rhode Island School of Design in 1995 and has lectured at colleges and universities across the US and taught at the Institute of American Indian Arts in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Duane's work has been exhibited nationally and internationally and has been included in many public collections, including the Smithsonian Institution and RISD Museum. His work is represented by the Gregory Lind Gallery in San Francisco and the Nielsen Gallery in Boston, among others. Martin Smick holds a BFA in painting from Washington University and an MFA in painting from RISD. He was a 2009 to 10 fellow at the Fine Arts Work Center and has exhibited work nationally. He teaches at RISD and Brown University. Recently, Martin has shown work with Leon Montez Gallery in Los Angeles, RK Projects located both in Providence and then New York City, and Rosenthal Gallery in San Francisco. Please join me in welcoming Dwayne and Martin. Oh, <laughs> I don't need this, okay. I'm going to use, pre pretend to use it anyway. Uh, uh, good evening on this uh, um, eventful day. Um, I don't, yeah, I'm just as stunned as uh, everybody else, the results of the election. Um, and uh, I just remembered as I was getting ready for class this morning, the. Uh, that uh, I had once had a conversation with Russell Means. Um, and uh, back when I was an undergraduate, uh, and Ronald Reagan was the president. Anyway, um, one of the questions I asked him was, uh, what, do you, you know, what do you think of uh, Ronald Reagan <laughs> as our president of the United States? And uh, uh, Russell Means, uh, you know, he thought about it for just a second, and he said, um, it's the best thing to happen to activists anywhere. Um, and there was just something I, you know, that just popped, you know, I just remembered um, as I uh, was listening to the news. So we're going to start, uh, we're going to be switching off here, me and my collaborator here. So I'm going to start. Finding Medicum. <coughs> In some tribal burial traditions, uh, the deceased are placed with their feet pointed to the east towards the sunrise. Um, it was particularly true of the, of the tribe I come from, the Meskwaki Nation. It is believed that in the morning after the burial, 
on the day after the burial. The first light of the new day will guide the spirit as it leaves to travel in its new home. Medicom was never afforded or given that right. Tonight I wanted to tell you a story, but I have to start you on a roller coaster um, that spans some 126 years. I need to tell it like this because this is how I remember the full weight of the story and is, and is how I know I will never forget. Um, we begin in 1994 in Provincetown, Massachusetts, where I had rented a studio and an apartment for the summer. Well, one day I met a gentleman who was trying to introduce himself to me for weeks. And it is clear once I meet him that he knows little about me and he knows very little about painting just as I knew nothing about him. But he did know one thing. He knew that I was Native American. My father is from the Meskwaki Nation of Iowa. My mother is from the Ho-Chunk Nation of Nebraska. I discovered the gentleman's name is Tim. Um, and he was diagnosed HIV positive in the late 1980s. Back, back then, the, this diagnosis was considered death sentence. And Tim had moved to the Cape to live out the rest of his days and settling his affairs, or, or setting his affairs in order, his mother informed him that he was one quarter Lakota Sioux. And this news blew his mind, and he was scouting for contacts and information on his native identity. He asked me to help him, so I agreed and quietly integrated myself into his circle. Tim had a larger than life career as a software designer in Silicon Valley. I think he, he had actually invented the screensaver. Um, his career was so, you know, was so large that he was able to retire once he learned of his HIV status. He used his time from retirement to work as an activist and had earned a press pass for the gay and lesbian cable network of that time. His assignment was to cover the news for the LGBT community while aboard Air Force One with President Clinton. Tim had surrounded himself with other LGBT and AIDS activists, which was an incredible education for me. One day, Tim announced his mentor was coming to visit him, and he invited me to meet him. His mentor was a man named Harry Hay, who was born in 1912 and is credited um, as the founding father of the gay and lesbian liberation movement. Harry had another story that interested me, and I wanted a chance to meet him. When Harry was 13 years old, he was invited by the Paiute Nation to attend a small feast in Nevada. On the day of the feast, the Paiute people picked him up in a horse-drawn cart and took him to the Paiute Reservation. <clears throat> when they arrived, the people were already singing and dancing, and Harry was taken to meet an elderly man. Um, whom he said everybody was working to take good care of. That elderly man was Wovoka himself. He was very old and he was blind. And he was about to deliver a blessing to Harry Hay. In American history, we cannot separate the Wounded Knee Massacre of 1890 without speaking of, of Wovoka and the ghost dance religion. In the late 1800s, most of the tribal nations were, were relocated to reservation lands, while disease and starvation led many to realize that they are unable to imagine themselves into the future. It was then that Wovoka had a vision, and through this vision, he instructed his followers to perform and sing dances for what he called the ghost dance religion. The tenets of the religion state that if, the if, the, if you do the dances, perform the prayers, abstain from alcohol, cause no trouble, a day of reckoning would arrive. The land would return to its former state, and the relatives would, re would return from the dead, and the white man would vanish from the face of the earth. This religion spread into many different tribes, and the white settlers and US officials were alarmed. The result was the Wounded Knee Massacre of 1890, in which U.S. forces opened fire 
on a band of Lakota people, killing over 150 men, women, and children. One source states that there may have been two early machine guns used on this crowd, and it is listed as the last great uprising in the Indian Wars. We now travel back to the Paiute Reservation in Nevada, circa 1922. Young Harry Hay was led to meet the uh, seated Paiute elder Wovoka. Wovoka did not shake his, oops, sorry. Wovoka did not shake his hand, but he placed his own hands over the head and across the shoulders of the boy, and he touched the sides of his face. He then said to his aides, treat this boy well. Feed him and send him on his way. One day he will be a good friend. In his professional life, after that, Harry Hay never abandoned his commitment of advocacy for the rights of Native people. And I surmise his successes primed him for the work he accomplished within his own LGBT community. So now we move back to 1994. Harry is now 82 years old. And I have a meeting with him in my studio in Provincetown and he asks to see some of my paintings. I show him a landscape painting filled with arm and hammer logos, marching the animals off a beautiful, beautiful cliff into a beautiful formalist abstract abyss. Harry looks at it closely for a long time and he looks at me and he says, exactly what is it you want to do with your work? So he catches me off guard a little bit. And I say to Harry, I want to hold people to accountability. And Harry turns back to the painting, clearly, ag clearly agitated by my response. And I wait for him to respond. Finally, Harry turns back to me and he says, well, you cannot do that. You cannot hold them to accountability. He says, you need to call them to consciousness before you hold them to accountability. Back in the early 90s, uh, I was uh, included in, a, in an exhibition called uh, We the Human Beings. And it was an exhibition organized by uh, Jean Quick to see Smith. Um, and uh, one of the things, uh, it, was, it was organized by Native people. Uh, funding was from sources, you know, from Native people, friendly to Native people. And uh, all of the artists uh, submitted their tribal name in their language with the um, translation. So as you can see, most of the, the languages are very descriptive. So for the Chippewa, I'm not going to try to pronounce these other people's Anishinaabe, uh, the Diné, the people, the Navajo, um, the Salish Kootenai translates, we the people. The Ho-Chunk, which is my mother's tribe, translates to the people of the big voice. Our government title is the Winnipego. The Meskwaki, um, or the people of the red earth, and the elders, the Meskwaki elders pronounce, you know, they get upset when, if, if anybody pronounces it Meskwaki, um, because they say that the proper pronunciation, pronunciation is Mishkwaki. The Sun people, Okanagan, the human person of this era, Flathead, we the human beings, the Southern Cyan, the beautiful people, and the Wampanoag, the people of the first light.
So I'm going to begin with a sort of a rhetorical question. Um, how many people in this room have heard of Thanksgiving? I'm guessing most of you have. Well, uh, on no November the 11th, on a, a day not unlike today, in the year 1620, on a clear autumn day, English pilgrims first arrived on the shores of what is today Provincetown, Massachusetts, on a ship called the Mayflower. A ship not unlike the one pictured here. Having spent two arduous months at sea, they were sick, starving, and fatigued. And after conducting several scouting trips, they determined a location to build a settlement in what would become the town of Plymouth, Massachusetts, about an hour west of where we are now. As you can see from this picture, the pilgrims were very white. The picture is uh, from the Pilgrim Hall Museum, founded in Plymouth, Massachusetts in 1820. The pilgrims would become part of uh, the mythology of American identity, admired by history books for their resilience, fortitude, and exceptionalism. They believed themselves to be ordained by God. There was only one problem. There were already people living here. They called themselves the people of the first light, known in their native tongue as the Wampanoag. Their ancestors had been living here in the region for nearly 10,000 years. The leader of this people was Massasoit, meaning great leader, Usa Mequin. Massasoit, sachem of the Wampanoag, made a treaty with the pilgrims in which the two people would not harm one another, would provide mutual protection, and would share and trade goods. After a difficult year where the pilgrims relied heavily on the Wampanoag for help, Massasoit joined the pilgrims in their first feast of thanksgiving. It was meant to celebrate their survival in the new world, survival that would not have been possible with, without the alliance made with Massasoit and the Wampanoag. Massasoit Usamequin lived into his 80s, but eventually died in 1660 or 61. His death marked the beginning of the end of the peace that was held between the pilgrims and the Wampanoag. Massasoit's firstborn son, Wamsutta, succeeded him, known to the English as Alexander Pocanoket. He would only briefly lead the Wampanoag. In 1662, he was taken prisoner by the English and questioned for three days by English Governor Josiah Winslow. A few days after his release, Alexander Pocanoket died of a mysterious illness, widely believed to have been intentionally poisoned by the English. This event would prove to be the beginning of a gradual erosion of relations between the English and the Wampanoag over the next 10 to 13 years. And you see here, this is a version of the, of the treaty. After Wamsutta's untimely death, he was succeeded by his younger brother, Metacomet, also known as Metacom, Pometacom, and called King Philip by the English. Metacomet was the second son of Massasoit Usamequin, born in 1639 at the height of his father's alliance with the English. Just 23 years old at the time of his brother's death, over the years, Metacomet would grow to staunchly object to the authority of the English. Years of betrayal, unfair and dishonest treaties and practices had led the Wampanoag to greatly mistrust the English. Finally, on a cold, late winter day in March of 1665, the body of a Christian Indian named John Sassamon was found under the ice of a local pond. Sassamon was translator for the English and held great value to them. He prompt, they, uh, the English promptly accused the three, three Wampanoag men affiliated with Metacomet of having killed Sassamon. After a hasty and unjust trial, the three men were executed. This betrayal was the final straw that led Metacomet to take up arms against the English. In what would become known as Metacomet's, Metacom's Rebellion or King Philip's War, Metacomet managed to unite the Wampanoag and other north, northeastern tribes, including the Narragansett and the Nipmuc, in one, of, uh, in one of the first great wars of resistance against the English colonization of North America. Uh, this is an etching 
by Paul Revere. Uh, we didn't realize he was a printmaker. Um, interested in King Philip, uh, interest in King Philip grew around the time of the Re Revolutionary War. His narrative was used as patriot propaganda because he valiantly fought the oppressive English. However, this later view of King Philip belies the reality of Metacomet's rebellion. The goal of the Indians was to retake their land and to push the English back into the sea. The appropriation of Metacomet's story conforms to a mythic American identity while ignoring the underlying truth of Metacomet's resistance. Metacomet's rebellion and the atrocities committed by the English colonists is one of the first examples of a war that was to be repeated throughout American history, westward expansion and the colonization of the entire continent of North America over the ensuing 340 years. At the end of King Philip's War, the Wampanoag were isolated on reservations, starving, sold into slavery, and converted to Christianity and assimilated into European culture. Part of the mythic narrative of American identity romanticizes New England architecture. This, uh, the New England house has long been a symbol of American identity, quaint and well adapted to its purpose. The New England house is a key symbol of the influence of European colonization. This is the seat of Metacom. It is where Metacom had held his council meetings and exists on property now owned by Brown University. So back to uh, 1675, 76. After a year of war and bloodshed, having pushed the English all the way back to the Atlantic coast, Metacomet and his warriors were heavily depleted and lacked the provisions, support, and manpower to continue their campaign. Having returned to his home village in Montop, Mount Hope, present-day Bristol, Rhode Island, which is um, Metacomet and his warriors were ambushed by Pilgrim Captain Benjamin Church and his forces. Metacomet was shot and killed. This is a, a path um, to a marker that marks the spot where Metacomet was killed. Metacomet's body was quartered and gruesomely hung from four trees. His head was severed and taken to Plymouth as a trophy. It would be staked on a pole and placed in the middle of Plymouth as a symbol of English victory over the Indians. During the war, Plymouth Colony suspended all feasts of Thanksgiving. The arrival of Metacomet's head in Plymouth was cause for the pilgrims to reinstate Thanksgiving. Metacomet's head remained on the pole for decades. This is the marker. It says, in the miry swamp, 150 feet west-southwest from this spring, according to tradition, King Philip fell August 12th, 1676. The stone was placed by the Rhode Island Historical Society, 1877. This would be the spot referred to on the marker. King Philip's War Club is an artifact with somewhat dubious provenance, believed to have belonged to King Philip himself it is exquisitely carved with wampum inlay. Wampum is a kind of shell bead made from the quahog, a clam uh, specific to the shores of southern Rhode Island and Massachusetts. 
The club is considered a prized object in the collection of the Fruitlands Museum in Harvard, Massachusetts. Fruitlands Museum was founded by a wealthy Boston Brahmin, Clara Endicott Sears, on a piece of property overlooking the Nashua River Valley in the town of Harvard, Massachusetts, just north of present-day Worcester, Massachusetts. The property had been the site of a failed commune experiment in the 1840s attempted by the transcendentalist thinker Bronson Alcott. Sears purchased the property some 40 years later and would found Fruitlands Museum. Sears was an avid writer, collector, and antiquarian who took a particular interest in the history of Native Americans in New England and King Philip's War in particular. These are pictures from inside the museum. During the 17th century, the land where Fruitlands now exists was Nipmuc territory and English settlements in the region, including nearby Lancaster, Massachusetts, were part of the ongoing conflict between the Indians and the English. In the 1930s, Sears commissioned her brother to make a bronze sculpture titled Pumagwanit, He Who Shoots the Stars, in an effort to honor the legacy of Native Americans. The statue today is a poignant example of 19th and 20th century tendency to romanticize Native people as noble savages. The literal advantage it's a concept introduced by author Jill Lepore in her book, The Name of War, King Philip's War and the Origins of American Identity, published in 1999. Lepore outlines the notion that King Philip's War was not just a war over territory, but it was a war over narrative, asking the question, who tells these stories and how are they told? Clara Sears, in spite of her best intentions to honor Native people, was part of this tradition of retelling King Philip's War from a European perspective. Sears wrote her own version of King Philip's War in a creative nonfiction style in her novel, The Great Pow Wow. So that ends the historical uh, part of this presentation. So at this point, um, I want to run through images from the show itself. Um, and uh, I think maybe what we would like to do is just run through images of the show and then maybe swing back and run through them again and give you uh, descriptions of each piece. Um, oh, and um, as part of the, the show, we put together a, uh, a book um, that was basically a photo journal of um, images, ruminations from our, um, our research and our quest to find Metacom. And um, many of these document the sort of uh, um, legacy, the casual um, transformation of Metacomet from from hero to American mascot. If you'd like to interject that at any point. I think we just switched to this microphone. Walking through the book here. Uh, the book accompanies the show. Uh, and we, we wanted a kind of a photo journal um, to document everything that we were finding along the way.
start. Okay, yeah, sure. Okay, um, the uh, Fruitlands is divided into three separate buildings, and the building, the Native American collection is in one building, um, and this is, you can see in the top monitor, uh, that's where uh, the club was. So what we did was we moved the club into the more sort of painting and contemporary wing. Um, and we placed these monitors in there with, you know, the absent club. And then again, with the video that, w that, w that we began with. Um, I'll let Martin talk about the, the video. So the video um, that you saw in the beginning as Dwayne was telling his story, uh, um, we broke the video into a couple parts. So mainly we were focused on uh, a video of the seat of Medicom, it's sort of a, a still video. And then um, the sunrise video, um, we, uh, we went down to um, Mount Hope um, on the morning of uh, August 13th of this past year. And we were able to video the sun rising um, in, an, in an attempt to, right. If you remember from the uh, marker, if the day he was killed was August 12th, 1676. Um, so sort of marking the day 340 years later. Um, by video, uh, taking a video of the sunrise the morning, or the following morning, and um, uh, sort of using that as a way to honor Meta Comet um, in the way he was not honored when he was killed. Let's go. Thank you very much. Sure. Uh, the books. Um, uh, a few years back, I was back in Iowa, at the University of Northern Iowa, and I was walking through their library. It's a very good library. It's a huge library. And uh, what I did was I photographed with my iPad. Um, I just walked through there, and I photographed all the books that were the, in the Native American section. Um, you know, just sort of capturing it and wanting to, you know, hoping to one day figure out how to use that in a piece. And uh, thankfully, you know, uh, this exhibition allowed me to kind of create that big stack. Uh, one of the things, can you go back to the next one? Uh, one of the things I, I didn't notice um, in all those photographs that we, that we combed through, um, I didn't notice it until we actually blew it up. Um, this book by Loudon, can you point it? Uh, it, what, was kind of, what was crazy, it was like, you know, all of the books, they're, they're in great shape. Um, not many people are reading them. Not many people are checking them out. But, you know, in looking at that one book, <laughs> it looks like, you know, it's, it's seen a lot of miles. Um, and then, of course, the title, Outrages Committed by the Indians in Their Wars with the White People. So I'm just wondering, you know, Who's, who's reading, who's checking this book out? And how many people are checking this book out? Okay, let's. The other idea was, you know, this was sort of like the established canon and very few of the authors as I was going through them, um, you know, were native people. They're all anthros and, uh, other types of writers. It also as a piece fit very well into the concept of a little advantage. The idea of who's telling the story. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. um, this, the screens, if you remember, um, uh, the image of uh, Pumaguanet bronze statue by Claire's uh, brother. Um, and so I wanted to use th this image with uh, the house, which is actually a Shaker house originally, but it's sort of as a proxy for the New England house. Um, and I 
sort of interested in the imagery of, of setting it ablaze, um, which would have uh, had a different context, um, you know, contextualizing it in terms of King Philip's War. Um, I mean, a large part of what that war was about was sort of burning down the, uh, the English settlements. Um, so he who shoots the stars instead becomes uh, sort of victorious in this scenario. The process of uh, putting the show together was kind of interesting in terms of the collaboration uh, because we came up with the different types of starter kinds of projects. And I don't, th I don't think we abandoned any of the starter projects. Yeah, they uh, we turned them into projects. Um, one of them was, uh, I, I was thinking about the idea of using some kind of text and language. Um, and we were we were pulling different types of quotes like the literal advantage um, and then after a while after we kind of really got going into the into the work um, I began to kind of start snipping all the sentences apart and creating different types of sentences uh, different texts um, the, the other thing is it's unrelated but uh uh, I had a residency in, in New Orleans, and my palette changed. Um, and I came back doing this, you know, using these colors. So I decided to just continue with it. Um, and everybody was calling it my Mississippi mud paintings. You should, um, tell me something about the screening process and the text, because that's why the text is so Oh, and what gives it that texture? So yeah. So. Um, as far as how the text was made, um, I, I've been using um, like window screen for a while now as a sort of uh, uh, adaptation of screen printing and uh, stenciling through window screen um, sort of allowed me to basically make these sort of blockouts uh, on, on window screen using acrylic medium. And um, so in order to put together these various phrases in the text paintings, which I'll just run back real quick to that big one. Um, I just sort of used a generic uh, text stencil you might find at Staples. Um, it would spell the words out and then um, in sort of acrylic medium and then make a negative of that and use that as the, um, as the stencil basically. And so that that's what gives the, these texts that kind of relief textural kind of quality. Um, uh, so this is sort of the main bank of text paintings. I think we did around, you know, 31, 32 of them total. Um, and, uh, you know, it sort of played in, again, to this idea of language and text as this sort of big component of colonization and how colonization works. Um, and so I think we were also interested then in, uh, once we had made a bunch of text paintings, um, in, uh, in actually going back to uh, removing the text. And so in some of these, you see the sort of absence of text. Um, they're still titled paintings, but they're um, without text. Um, and uh, so, is there anything else we want to cover? Do you want to show the video of the clip? Yeah. So we thought we would finish with um, you saw there were two videos that were in the uh, display case where the club normally resides. Um, one of them was the um, video of the seat of Metacom in the sunrise. And then the other video whoop, is not there. <laughs> um, Okay, well, that is it. So, uh, yeah, questions. questions at this point? Yeah. I'm happy to uh, indulge.
that story. <laughs> um, well, let's see. Uh, the the uh, Fruitlands Museum curator, Mike Vollmer, uh, they, it, they, they have a complicated history, but um, he approached me, he wanted, he offered me a solo show. Um, and um, he w went up there, we looked at the space, and um, he said, you know, it would be great if you did something working with the collection, if the show engaged the collection. He didn't say which collection. You know, there's the transcendental collection, there's this, this, the Shakers. The Shakers, there's the 19th century Hudson, the Valley Hudson River Valley painting, the, the huge collection. And then there's the Native American collection. So I was like, you know, and then there's this whole, you know, the whole history of the transcendentalists. And I was like, you know, where do you even begin? So I proposed a, uh, a collaborative. Um, rather than trying to do a solo show, because I was kind of looking for some other way of kind of engaging or, or, and then creating the work other than just me in the studio. And so um, uh, Martin's got incredible research skills, um, and we're already co sort of in conversation about work, so I thought that would be the, the way to go. So that's how it happened. We didn't initially uh, focus or intend to focus on the club, and that um, that's part of what was interesting is that we, this whole subject sort of emerged as we, mm -hmm. um, as we got deeper into the project, but um, it sort of began um, with more of an examination of this whole idea of, um, you know, how the, the museum itself presents its collection and how Native Americans um, and that collection itself in particular uh, uh, represents um, the, the story of Native Americans and uh, I think wanting to um, express some uh, level of institutional critique where we could look um, a little bit deeper and try to understand um, or find other ways of um, engaging the material that we found there um, and activating it. Yeah, it became very apparent. I was initially interested in the diorama they had made of the Sundance. These things were made like the early 1900s, and they're very accurate. And I was looking at it, and I, and I knew where the, their designer, whoever made this diorama, I could identify the photographs where they were getting them. Um, you know, to pose everything and for, quote, accuracy which was not accurate. But it was just like, it was just too problematic to kind of deal with the idea of the Sundance. And then we were also focused on the club. So it just, we realized the history was so large, so broad. You know, we had to just focus on that one thing. Um, well, you know, they've been able to trace it uh, to a, a gentleman in the early uh, 1700s by the name of John Sheckley, who had been in contact with an early um, you know, someone else. But, you know, I think it's, it's someone else that dated to that particular uh, period. But, you know, it's, it's still questionable, and it's, it's hard to know uh, exactly. Pretty vague. Yeah, yeah. Well, they have. They do have a plaque that doubts. <laughs> yeah. There, you know, that to their credit. Yeah. Yeah. There was a little bit of that. As it was kind of like we agreed on, you know, like my text paintings, he was going to do his text paintings. Mm -hmm. You know, the more abstract ones with all the color, you know, 
that's that's part. <laughs> um, and I'm the more <laughs> reserved guy. Mississippi mud. Mississippi mud. Um, yeah, I mean, we we were doing this distinct paintings. That we did one co actual collaborative painting, this um, but within that whole set, um, there, you know, each of us is represented. But the rest of the, you know, you know, going on this, the, you know, going to Bristol several times, photographing, videotaping. Um, you know, we were always there kind of picking the shots and all of that type of thing. There are elements from the show that were not, like we didn't give the, the entire book um, here. I mean, there were aspects to it that we couldn't really um, translate in the same way, but. Um, but it's also, we also have both have studios in the same building, so that makes the collaboration yeah. <laughs> a little more fluid. the viewer's experiences of the text itself? Um, I think, you know, we're trying to uh, As Dwayne said in the beginning, it's sort of a call to consciousness and sort of, um, you know, keep talking about this as a way to honor Metacomet. So there's a component of, I mean, part of why through the presentation we tell the whole story. And in the show, there's a lot of placards around um, sort of conveying these histor this historical elements. Um, you know, I guess it's uh, trying to make the story more present and not so, you know, mired in the past and, um, you know, give it, uh, you know, be connected to the present in some way. Um, I don't know, Dwayne, you want to? I guess I'm thinking about the, or one of the things I became interested in for myself, anyway, as, as it kind of went along and then I began to dismantle uh, some of the texts that we created to kind of create these other different texts that were very related. Like, you know, like this whole kind of like uh, this, I'm critiquing my own, <laughs> it's like critiquing the word. The, the, the kind of centering, you know, it, it, it is okay, but it's not you know, something I want to, yeah. What I wanted to do was, um, let me find it here. I, I used to do like some kind of performance stuff and make artist books and storytelling. And uh, I just kind of like, you know, thinking about the, what, you know, how I conduct myself in those, you know, how I operate through, through those types of practices. But the idea was I wanted to try to find or create a voice in the work itself. Like, and so I began, you know, like the people go unspoken, the war goes unspoken. His war is in the water, it is in the light. I am, I have, this is forever. And even, you know, just kind of like layering this kind of muted palette and this kind of, this kind of, I could say mud on mud um, palette with that text was kind of the idea of like, maybe maybe there is that kind of, there's, there's this low key voice that's just, that's part of the ambience of, of the show. And you know, it makes me think it's, it's also one of the things that we talked about. The museum kept coming at us, you know, it's, <laughs> which was kind of interesting, you know, about, you know, the clarity of the work. And so, you know, it's like, part of the reason that there's a spread of types of work was to kind of address these concerns of the museum. Um, there's photographs, there's text, uh, the figure is present, 
uh, through the shadows uh, and then Martin's work. Um, what else? We have video. Um, and so it was sort of like, okay, you know, we'll give them the, this entire thing because we need to give them different types of access points. If they cannot reach it through here, maybe they'll reach it over here. And I, I believe that was successful for that audience. There was also, I think we, will, we didn't want to be overly explicit um, with the work, but let the work um, in a way uh, you know, spark an interest in, in the story um, and sort of um, lead you to the story but not necessarily uh, tell it in such a um, literal way. Um, so, you know, and I think also for me, you know, I, I wanted the text, you know, there was part of the complexity is that our shared history and background, um, you know, and I felt like certain aspects needed to be his voice. Um, and as far as the text was concerned, I wanted um, certain like texts to just be lifted from something where I wasn't actually using, it wasn't my voice, but it was from, um, it was being, you know, it's being taken from some of the research, from some aspect of the research. Um, yes. Yes. <laughs> yes, it did. Um, sort of, uh, I wouldn't say it's by chance, but a, 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 a friend of mine who's uh, went to my high school is Mashpee Wampanoag, and he uh, he came and visited us. We asked him to come visit us while we were working on the show. He has an aunt who's actually working on compiling a uh, a uh, who's working on reconstructing the Wampanoag language um, through. Um, through uh, the Indian Bibles that, uh, and those translations. So, you know, we, uh, we certainly um, sought out uh, some of that contact, but we also, I think, um, were, um, yeah. So yes. <laughs> All right, thank, thank you. you.